continuing where I left off, chapter 16. In April, the troops were heartened by news of the Tsar's arrival, but Rostov did not succeed in being present at the review he held at Bartenstein, as the Pavlograds were stationed at the outpost far beyond Bartenstein. They were by Voaking. Denistov and Rostov were living in a mud hut roofed with branches and turf that the soldiers had made for them. It was constructed by the following method, which had then come into vogue. A trench was dug, was dug three and a half feet wide, four and a half feet deep, and eight feet long. Steps were cut at one end of the trench, which formed the entrance and vestibule. The trench itself was the room, and those who were lucky, such as the squadron commander, had at the end opposite the entrance a plank resting on four stakes for a table. On both sides of the trench, the earth was dug out to a breadth of about two and a half feet to serve as beds and seats. The roof was so constructed that one could stand up in the middle of the trench and even sit up on the beds if one leaned toward the table. Denisov, who was living luxuriously because he was liked by his men, also had a board over the entrance with a piece of broken but mended glass in it for a window. When it was very cold, embers from the soldier campfires were brought on a bent sheet of iron and placed on the steps in the reception room, as Denisov called the part of the hut, and this made it so warm that the officers of whom there were always a number with Denisov and Rostov could sit in their shirt sleeves. In April, Rostov was the duty officer, returning between seven and eight one morning after a night without sleep. He sent for embers, changed his rain-soaked rain undercloths, said his prayers, drank some tea, and warmed himself. Then he tied up the things on the table, and in his own corner, and his face glowing from exposure to the rent, wind, stretched out on his back in his shirt sleeves with his hands under his head. He was pleasantly reflecting on the promotion he would probably receive in a day or two for his last reconnaissance mission, and was awaiting Denisov, who had gone out somewhere. He wanted to have a talk with him. All at once he heard Denisov shouting behind the hut, obviously in a thundering rage. Rostov went to the window to see whom he was shouting at, and saw the quartermaster, Tapchekineko. I gave you orders not to let them eat that boot. That mashka stuff, roared Denisov, and with my own eyes I saw a laser truck winging it in from the fields. I did give the order, again and again, your honor, but they don't obey, replied the quartermaster. Rostov lay down on his bed again and complacently thought, let him fuss and fume now. I've done my job and I'm lying down. It's wonderful. Through the wall, he could also hear Denisov's orderly, the glib, rascally Lavashka. He was saying something about loaded wagons, rusk, and oxen he had seen when he had gone out for provisions. Then Denisov's voice was heard from farther off shoutings. Saddle! Second platoon! Where are they off to? Rostov wondered. Five minutes later, Denisov came into the hut, climbed onto the bed with muddy boots, furiously lit his pipe, and scattered his things about as he put on his riding whip and saber and went out again. When Rostov asked him where he was going, he vaguely and angrily replied that he had business to attend to, and then let God and our great sovereign be my judge, said Denisov as he went out. Outside the hut, Rostov heard the hoofs of several horses splashing through the mud. He did not even trouble to find out where Denisov had gone. Having got warm in his corner, he fell asleep and did not go out till late afternoon. Denisov had not yet returned. The weather had cleared. Near the next hut, two officers and a cadet were playing a game of quats and laughing as the quats sank into the soft mud. Rostov joined them. In the middle of the game, the officers saw several wagons approaching. Some fifteen hussars mounted on scraggy horses followed. The wagons, escorted by the hussars, drew up to the picket ropes, and a crowd of hussars surrounded them. There now, Denisov kept worrying, and here the provisions had come, said Rostov. And high time. Won't the men be glad, said the officers. A little behind the hussars rode Denisov, accompanied by two infantry officers with whom he was discussing something. Rostov went to meet them. I warn you, Captain, one of the officers, a short, thin man, apparently 
incensed but was saying. And I've told you I won't give them up, answered Denisov. You will have to answer for it, Captain. This is mutiny, seizing the transports from your own army. Our men have not eaten for two days. And my men have not eaten for two weeks. This is highway robbery. Your answer for it, sir, said the infantry officer, raising his voice. Why are you pestuing me, eh? shouted Denisov, suddenly losing his temper. I'll answer for it, not you, so don't keep buzzing around here if you don't want to get hurt. Now march, he shouted at the officers. Very well then, cried the little officer, not in the least intimidated and not moving. If you're determined to go through with this raid, then I'll go to hell, quick march, while you're still in one piece. And Denisov turned his horse and made for the officer. All right, all right, muttered the officer threateningly, and he turned and trotted off, bouncing in his saddle. A dog astride a fence, a living astride a fence, shouted Denisov after him. This being the greatest insult a cavalryman can address to an infantryman on the horseback, he rode up to Rostov, roaring with laughter. Took him away from the infantry. Take him by force, he said. Can't let my men starve to death, can I? The wagons that were now in possession of the hussars had been consigned, co-signed to an infantry regiment. But learning from Larushka that the transport was unescorted, Denisov and his hussars had seized it by force. Rush was distributed to the soldiers without stint, and were even shared with other squadrons. Next day, the regimental commander sent for Denisov, and holding his outspread fingers before his eyes, said to him, This is how I look at the affair. I know nothing about it and shall take no action, but I advise you to ride over to the staff and set things straight with the commissionary and, if possible, sign a receipt for such and such stores received. If not, and the requisition is entered against the infantry regiment, there will be a row and it might end badly. Denisov went straight from the colonel to the staff with a sincere desire to act on his advice. In the evening, he returned to his hut in a state such as Rostov had never before seen in his friend. He could not speak and was gasping for breath. When Rostov asked him what was wrong, he could only utter incoherent threats and oaths in a hoarse, feeble voice. Alarmed at Denisov's condition, Rostov suggested that he undress and drink some water, and he sent for the doctor. I am to be twied for wobbly. Oh, give me more water. Let them twy me, but I'll, I'll always thwash quandles, and I'll tell the Tsar. Give me ice, he kept saying. The regimental doctor said it was necessary to bleed him. Only after a soup bowl full of black blood had been taken from his hairy arm was he able to relate what had happened to him. I get there, Denisov began, and I asked them, Where are your chief's quarters? They show me. Be so, be so good as to wait. I witten thirty versts and have duties to attend to. I have no time to wait, announce me. Very well. Out comes the Wabin chief. He also takes into his head to lecture me. This is Wabu, he says. A Waba, I tell him, is not a man who takes provisions to feed his soldiers, but a man who steals to fill his own pockets. Very well. Go and sign a receipt in the commissioner's office, he says. But this affair will be reported to the headquarters. I go to the commissioner. I walk in, and there at the table, who do you suppose? No, think. Who is it that's been starving us to death? shouted Denisov, pounding the table with the fists of his lance arm so violently that the tumblers jump and the board almost collapse. Tell Yenin, so it is so it is you who's been starving us to death, is it? And I let him have it, landed one white on his snout. Ah, you so and so. And I started beating him up. It was a real pleasure, I can tell you, he shouted, burying his white teeth under the black mustache with malicious glee. I have them killed if they hadn't wagged me away. But what are you shouting for? said Rostov. Now you started your arm bleeding. Wait, we must bind it up again. Denisov was bandaged up once more and put to bed. Next day he woke up to calm and good spirits. But at noon the adjutant of the regiment appeared in their hut and with a grave and serious face regretfully showed them a formal communication from the regimental commander to Major Denisov in which inquiries were made into the events of the precious day. The adjutant informed them that the affair was likely to take a very bad turn, that a court-martial had been appointed, and that in, a few, in, in view of the present severity which 
marauding and insubordination were regarded, he might consider himself lucky if the matter ended in his being degraded to the ranks. The case, as presented by the offended parties, was that after seizing the transport, Major Denisov, without provocation and in a drunken state, had appeared before the chief quartermaster, called him a three, threatened to strike him, and being let out, had rushed into the office and unmercifully beaten two officials, dislocating the arm of one of them. In response to further questioning by Rostov, Denisov laughed and said that he seemed to remember that some other fellow had got mixed up in it, but that it was all nonsense, nothing worth bothering about that he would never dream of being afraid of any court-martial, and that if those scoundrels dared to pick a quarrel with him, he would give them an answer they wouldn't soon forget. Denisov spoke scornfully of the whole matter, but Rostov knew him too well not to observe that at heart, though he had hid it from others, he feared the court-martial and was worried over the affair, which was certain to have dire consequences. Official papers began to arrive daily, forms to be filled out, court summonses, and on the first day of May, in order for Denisov to turn his squadron over to the next in seniority and appeared before the divisional staff for an investigation into his violence in the commissar commissariat office. On the preceding day, Platov made a reconnaissance of the enemy with two Cossack regiments and two squadrons of hussars. Denisov, as always, rode out in front of the line, parading his courage. A bullet fired by a French sharpshooter hit him in the fleshy part of the leg. Perhaps at any other time Denisov would have not left the regiment for so slight a wound, but now he took advantage of it and to excuse himself from appearing before the staff and entered the hospital. Chapter 17 The Battle of Freilin, in which the Palvoglads did not take part, was fought in June and was followed by the declaration of an armistice. Rostov who keenly felt the absence of his friend, having no news from him since he left, and feeling anxious about his wound and the progress of his affairs, took advantage of the truce to obtain leave to visit Denisov in the hospital. The hospital was in a small Prussian town that had twice been devastated by Russian and French troops. Because it was summer, when the meadows looked so lovely, the little town with its damaged roofs and fences, its, filth, its filthy streets and ragged inhabitants, and the sick and drunken soldiers wandering about presented a particularly dismal appearance. The hospital, which was situated in a brick building that had a number of damaged window frames and broken panes, stood in a yard surrounded by the remnants of a fence. A number of bandaged soldiers with pale swollen faces were walking about the yard or sitting in the sunshine. As soon as Rostov entered the door, he was enveloped in a stench of putrefying flesh and the usual hospital smells. On the stairs, he met a Russian army doctor smoking a cigar. The doctor was followed by a Russian felcher. I can't be everywhere at once, the doctor was saying. Come to Makar Alayevich this evening. I'll be there. The medical assistant asked him another question. Oh, do as you think best. What difference does it make? The doctor caught sight of Rostov coming up the stairs. What are you doing here, your honor? Asked the doctor. Since the bullets have spared you, do you want to give Typhus a chance? This, my good sir, is a pet house. What do you mean? asked Rostov. Typhus, sir, it's deaf to come within these walls. Only we two, Makayev and I, he pointed out to the felsher, are still on our feet here. Half a dozen of our colleagues have been killed off. A new man comes. Done for in a week, said the doctor with evident satisfaction. Prussian doctors have been called in. But these allies of ours don't seem to care for the job. Rostov explained that he wanted to see Major Denisov of the Hussars who had been brought in wounded. Don't know, can't tell you, my good sir. Just think, I've got three hospitals on my hands, over 400 patients. It's a good thing the philanthropic ladies of Prussia send us a couple of pounds of coffee and some lint every month or we'd be lost. He laughed. 400, sir, and they keep sending more all the time. It is four hundred, isn't it? he asked, turning to the felsher. The felsher looked exhausted. He was obviously irritated and impatient for the talkative doctor to go. Major Denisov, repeated Rostov, he was wounded at Molotin. Dead, probably. Eh, Makave, inquired the doctor in a tone of indifference. The felsher, however, did not confirm the doctor's words. Is he a tall is he a tall man with reddish hair at the doctor? Rostov described Denisov's appearance. Yes, there was someone like that, said the doctor as if delighted. He's sure to be dead, but I'll look it up. We had list. 
Have you got them, Makayev? Maker Alayevich had the list, replied. Sure, but if you will go to the officer's ward, you'll see for yourself, he added, turning to Rostov. Better not go, sir, said the doctor, or you may have to stay here. But Rostov took leave of the doctor with a bow and asked, with a bow and asked the felcher to show him the way. Well, don't blame me afterward, the doctor shouted up the stairs after him. Rostov and the felcher turned into a corridor. The hospital stench was so strong in this dark patches that Rostov held his nose and had to pause and brace himself to go on. A door opened on the right, and a sallow, emaciated man, barefoot and wearing nothing but underclothes, hobbled out on the crutches. He leaned against the doorpost and gazed at them with glittering, envious eyes. Rostov glanced into the room and saw that the sick and wounded were lying on the floor, some on straw, some on great coats. What is that? asked Rostov. Those are the soldiers, answered the felsher. What can we do? he added, as if excusing himself. May I go in? Look. What is there to see? replied the felsher. But just because the medical system was obviously reluctant to let him go in, Rostov went into the soldier's ward. The stench, which he was beginning to get used to in the corridor, was still stronger here. It was slightly different, more penetrating, and one felt that this was where it originated. In the long room, brightly lighted by the sun shining through the large window, the sick and wounded laid in two rows with their heads to the wall, leaving a passage down the middle. Most of them were unconscious and totally aware of anyone entering the room. The others raised themselves or lifted their thin yellow faces, all gazing intently at Rostov with the same expression of hope for help, reproach, and envy of another's help. Rostov walked to the middle of the room, glanced through the open doors into the two adjoining rooms, and saw the same thing there. He stood still, looking around him in silence. He had never expected to see anything like this. Just before him, lying halfway across the passage on the bare floor was a sick man, probably a Kozak, judging by the way his hair was cut. The man laid on his back, his huge arms and legs outstretched. His face was a reddish-purple color. His eyes were rolled back in his head, so that the only... The whites were visible, and the veins in his bare arms and legs, which were still red, stood out like cords. He was knocking the back of his head against the floor and hoarsely uttering one word over and over again. Rostov listened, trying to understand what he was saying, and made out the word he kept repeating. It was, drink, drink, a drink. Rostov looked around in search of someone who would put the sick man in his place and give him some water. Who looks after the patients here, he asked the felsher. Just an orderly, an army service corps man came in from the next room, marched smartly up to Rostov, and drew himself up to attention. Long live your excellency, bawled the soldier, the eyes popping out of his head as he addressed Rostov, whom he evidently mistook for a hospital official. Give him, him back in his place and give him some water, said Rostov, pointing to the Cossack. Yes, sir, your ex excellency, responded the soldier, his eyes bulging with exertion as he drew himself up still straighter but did not stir from the spot no there's nothing i can do here thought rostov lowering his eyes he was about to go out but because but be go out but became aware of an intense gaze fixed on him from the right and turned almost in the very corner of the room sitting on the great coat was an old unshaven gray bearded soldier thin as a skeleton with a stern sallow face st staring relentlessly at him the man's neighbor was whispering something to him pointing to rostov Rostov realized that the old man wanted to ask him something. He went closer and saw that he only had one leg bent under him. The other had been amputated at the knee. His neighbor on the other side, who lay motionless at some distance from him with his head thrown back, was a young soldier. His pale waxen face with its snubbed nose was still covered with freckles and his eyes were rolled back under their lids. Rostov looked at this young soldier and a cold chill ran down his back. Why, this one seems... He began turning to the felcher. We have begged and pleaded, your honor, said the old soldier, his jaw quivering. After all, we are men, not dogs. I'll send someone at once. He'll be taken away, taken away at once, said the felcher. Come, your honor. Yes, yes, let us go, said Rostov hastily, hastily, and lowering his eyes and shrinking into himself, he tried to pass unnoticed between the rows of reproachful, envious eyes that were fixed on him as he went out of the room. Chapter 18 The Felsher left Rostov down the corridor to the officers' toward wards, which consisted of three rooms with doors opening into each other. 
There were beds in these rooms. The sick and wounded officers were lying or sitting on them. Some were walking about the room in hospital dressing gowns. The first person Rostov met in the officer's ward was a thin little man with one arm who was walking about the first room in a nightcap and a hospital dressing gown with a short pipe between his teeth. Rostov looked at him, trying to recall where he had seen him before. So bring, so fate brings us together again, said the little man. Tushin, Tushin, remember, I gave you a little lift at Schlagelgraben. They sliced a bit off me, as you see, he went on, pointing to the empty sleeve on his dressing gown with a smile. Looking for Vasily Dmitry's Besonov, are you? A fellow lodger, he said, when he heard who Rostov wanted. Here, this way, and Tushin led him into the next room, from which came the sound of loud laughter. How can they possibly exist in this place, much less laugh, thought Rostov, with the smell of the corpse in the soldiers, ward still in his nostrils and still seeing the envious glances that had followed him out of the room and the face of that young soldier with his eyes rolled back in his head. Denisov laid in bed asleep with his head under the blanket, though it was almost noon. Ah, Rostov, how are you? How are you? called out. And though he sounded the same as in the regiment, Rostov noticed with sorrow that under his habitual swagger and exuberance some new sinister hidden feeling was discernible, both in the expression of his face and the intonations of his voice. His wound, though slight, had not yet healed, despite the fact that six weeks had passed since he received it. His face had the same puffiness and pallor as all the faces in the hospital. But it was not this that struck Rostov. What struck him was that Denisov did not seem glad to see him and that his smile was forced. He did not ask what about, about the regiment, nor about the general state of the affairs when Rostov talked of those matters. Denisov did not listen. Rostov noticed that Denisov actually disliked being reminded of the regiment, or, in general, of that other free life that was going on outside the hospital. He seemed to be trying to forget that old life, and was only interested in the affair with the commercial officers. On Rostov's query as to how matters stood, he promptly drew out from under his pillow a paper he had received from the commission and a rough draft of his reply. He grew more animated as he began to read this letter and made a point of drawing Rostov's attention to the caustic gibes he addressed to his enemies. Denisov's hospital companions, who had gathered around Rostov as a fresh arrival from the outside world, gradually drifted away when he commenced reading this letter. From their faces, Rostov could see that they all heard the whole story more than once and were by now hardly sick of it. Only the man who had the next bed at Stout Ulan, who continued to sit on his bed when he scowling and smoking a pipe, and little one-armed Tushin continued to listen, the latter shaking his head in disapproval. In the middle of the reading, the Ulan interrupted Denisov. But what I say is, he broke in, he simply ought to penetition the Tsar for pardon. Just now, they say, there'll be great rewards distributed, and a pardon sure to be granted. My, me, penitician the Tsar, exclaimed Denisov in a voice to which he tried to give the old energy and fire, but which sounded like an expression of impotent irritability. What for? If I were a wobber, I might ask for mercy, but I'm being court-martialed for bringing wobbers to book. Let them twy me. I'm not afraid of anyone. I serve the Tsar in my county honorably, and I am not a thief. And to reduce me to the wanks and... Listen, I'll tell them straight out, this is what I want. If I had wob the treasury, it's well put, no question about it, said Tushin, but it's not the point, vastly Dmitri. And he, too, turned to Rostov. One has to resign oneself, and that's why vastly Dmitri is unwilling to do. You know the auditor told you it was bad business. Well, let it be bad, said Denisov. The auditor wrote out a petition for you, continued Tushkin, and you ought to sign it and send it off with this gentleman. No doubt he, indicating Rostov, has connections on the staff. You won't find a better opportunity. Haven't I said I'm not going to grovel? Denisov interrupted him and went on reading his reply. Rostov did not dare to try and persuade Denisov through his instinctively felt that the course advised by Tushkin and the other officers was the most judicious one, and though he would have been happy to be of service to Denisov, he knew his friend inflexible will and passionate integrity. When the reading of Denisov's virulent reply was over, which took more than an hour, Rostov said nothing, and in a most dejected frame of mind spent the rest of the day in the society of Denisov's hospital with companions, who had gathered around him again, telling them what he knew and listening to their stories. Denisov maintained a morose silence the whole evening. 
Late in the evening, when he was about to leave, Rostov asked Denisov whether he had any commission for him. Yes, wait a moment, said Denisov, and after glancing at the other officers, he took the papers from under his pillow, went over to the window where he had an inkstand, and sat down to write. It seems it is no use kicking against the pricks, he said, coming back and handing Rostov a large envelope. It was the penitition to the Tsar drawn up by the auditor in which Denisov, making no reference to the offenses of the commissionary department, simply asked for pardon. Handed in, it seems, he did not finish, but smiled a painfully unnatural smile. And I'm going to leave it off there. Thank you so much for watching. Please give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Leave a comment below. Subscribe or keep watching. And I will see you in the next